Hi there, and welcome back to Gecho Crafts. I'm Sarah, and today I have a spinning project um, to tell you about. Um, now, if you're following us at Gecho Crafts over on Instagram, you'll have seen some photos that I've been teasing over the past couple, couple of weeks as I've been working on this. But I'm really excited to share the end results of this um, spinning project. I think it's the, the most fun I've had with spinning since I started, and um, it's really interesting to me, um, anyway, how this, this inspiration kind of took hold and um, what my end results were. Uh, so I keep looking down because I have the yarns in front of me and I'll show those off in a second. But I first wanted to start off by telling you a little bit about my motivation for this particular project. So if you are um, a knitter and you're, you look at patterns, modern patterns uh, frequently, you'll be very aware of um, a designer Andrea Mowry, she goes by the name Dre Renee Knits, and she um, has a bunch of very successful patterns. She's, she's highly sought after as a designer, and her uh, patterns are knit in the thousands. Um, so she's very successful, and rightfully so. And she, last year, right around Rhinebeck, October of 2018, um, right around the time of the New York Sheep and Wool Festival, she released a pattern called Night Shift. Um, this is a large triangular shawl knit in a worsted weight color shifting yarn and it's absolutely gorgeous. It's based on a smaller design that she had for a cowl based out of the same yarn company. And when I saw that night shift, um, I absolutely fell in love with it and was really mesmerized by it, really drawn to it. I just kept staring at pictures of it. I saved pictures to my phone and would just, you know, pull out my phone and look at it. Um, I really, really loved her color combinations and the visual texture that she had created um, with that design and I really wanted to make it or so I thought. Um, now the yarn that she used is a well-known yarn um, it's called Spin Cycle and it's a small company it's run by two women out of Northwest uh, Washington State up in Bellingham and they started off as two people who were hand spinning yarn and um, eventually have grown that into a, a larger scale business where they machine spin, but their yarns have the look of hand spun. So they have kind of a barber, barber pole or a marled effect where you get multiple um, individual strands of color that slowly shift and blend together um, as you do in, in hand spinning yarns. Um, and their yarns are really gorgeous. They are um, at a higher price point than I normally buy my yarns. Um, so for this uh, night shift shawl, for example, you'd be spending right around $200 for the six uh, skeins of yarn that you need for that shawl. So that's not, again, to say anything bad about Spin Cycle. They're, they're amazing. Um, I love they're, they're doing a whole sheep to skein process. Um, so the wool is American, it's processed in the U.S., it's dyed by them, um, it's spun by them. So, you know, kudos um, to the ladies of Spin Cycle for doing a great job uh, with the local wool. Um, it just happens to be out of my price point for, um, for a larger project that needs multiple skeins. I have bought some of their, their yarns in smaller quantities. So all of this is a rambling way to say, well, you know, could I... Could I reverse engineer? Could I sort of use their hand spinning or hand spinning techniques to achieve a spin cycle-ish yarn, which is kind of a funny question to ask because when you sit and think about it, of course you can because their yarn is machine spun made to look like hand spun, right? So you should be able to hand spin. Um, and then I realized that I had a bunch of scraps of different kinds of yarn, different, or sorry, different kinds of fibers in my stash, um, many of which were gifted to me last fall by a good friend, and um, some of which I got from a class. They were leftover materials that I didn't have time to spin in class, and they were all wildly different colors. Um, but I weighed them out, and I had roughly the, the total weight, the shawl, um, requires around a pound of yarn. And I thought, well, that's an interesting challenge. Can I spin something with materials I already have on hand 
and get an overall effect. I'm of course not going to be able to duplicate those exact colors, but can I get an overall effect of this design and this shawl? And so I started looking at the night shift shawl a little bit more closely. And what I realized is that the designer had put in and paired up kind of a dark, a medium, and a light in both a warm colorway and a cool colorway. So six colors all together, two lights, a, a warm and a cool, two mediums, a warm and a cool, and two darks, a warm and a cool. And so that gave me the idea to separate all of my fiber out into those same six categories and spin them um, and see what I could come up with. Um, and this exercise of constraint can be very inspiring. I've, I've found that to be true in a lot of areas. Um, and one example that came to mind was when I was in high school and we were, did our poetry unit in our English class, we had to write poems using different structures. So we wrote haiku, we wrote sonnets, we did other forms I can't remember the names of, um, but it was very interested to be limited by that structure and still try to convey an idea or a feeling or a mood um, or express an emotion um, through, that, through that confined structure. Um, and in some ways really sparks your creativity because you're trying to fit you know, this kind of a peg into that kind of a hole and they don't necessarily line up. And so how do you, how do you get that to work together? Um, and this was the same way. I had certain colors. I hadn't chosen the colors. They were just things I'd accumulated. And so I had to kind of break those down and see where I could fit things together. Um, so my first step was to lay all of my fiber out in, a, in one long sort of pile and to start grouping things by, is this dark? Is this medium? Is it light? Is it a warm kind of color or is it a cool kind of color? And to make, start separating one big pile into six little piles to see how I could break things down. Um, now I had a lot more of certain colors than I had of others. And um, so that, that presented its own challenge. So once I had them roughly divided into six piles, I then weighed each pile and figured out what my average should be. And that was about 70 grams of fiber per colorway. And so then I had to um, resort them slightly and reorganize them so that each pile had about 70 grams. And in some cases I got a fairly cohesive colorway in the end. In some cases I got a a pretty wildly different colorway um, but again what they had in common was they were all roughly a cool light tone or a warm medium tone um, so once I did that then I spun up my singles and I would say I've, I've had mixed success in getting the colors to line up from the single into then a two ply which was the third step um, so I, I spun each single I spun onto one bobbin from start to finish um, and then I, I took them off the bobbins and wound them into centerful balls and then spun end to end to make a two-ply yarn. Um, and that was very challenging and um, on Instagram and in other uh, forums I did speak with some people who are more experienced at spinning than I do because I've seen this technique talked about a lot where you wind your singles into a center pool ball and then you spin from the beginning and the end. And what this allows you to do is use up all of that fiber and not have a few yards of one color or one bobbin left over. Um, it was extremely challenging for me. I did try to not put too much energy into my singles to make sure they weren't super over twisted and kinky. Um, I let them rest on the bobbins before I wound them into the balls. I let them rest in the balls before I tried to spin them into the two plies. Um, I tried using a yarn bowl, a basket, a coffee cup with, you know, looping one end through the handle of the coffee cup. I tried all these different methods and each time I would start out with high hopes and then just end up with a tangled mess. So fortunately, um, 
I have a human being that I live with who's very willing, thank you Rick, um, to help out. And we found, um, working together, we found the best method for spinning from the center pole ball into a two-ply yarn was for Rick to sit on the floor across the living room from where I was and to slowly feed out the yarn from both ends and to tell me when to stop and untangle things. Um, and he actually got very good by the end at controlling the outside and the inside yarn of the center pool ball so that they were feeding at a very even uh, rate and tension and um, making sure there weren't any kinks coming my way or that if there was a problem that he couldn't uh, fix that I knew that it was coming up and so I could adjust and fix it on my end. And uh, I was teasing him today. I was calling him the, um, what was it? The very, the very useful Rick rather than the lazy Kate. Um, right, there was a very active Rick rather than Lazy Kate because he he did have to do work and, and monitor um, each one of these as they were being plied. So kudos to those of you who are able to spin um, regularly from a center pool ball. I absolutely hate doing it. <laughs> I will say that up front. And um, I'm going to endeavor to not have to do it again. I don't know what I'll do. Maybe I'll um, measure out my singles and make sure I have even yardage and put them back onto bobbins or something like that. But I think I would rather spend the time doing that than, than fighting and trying to untangle um, a center pool ball. So that's just my, my takeaway from that process. Um, so, but my other takeaway from the process was, wow, what an interesting experiment, right? Again, working within that constraint, fr constraint framework of you know, you have these limited colors and or these colors that you might never have thought you could put together or wanted to put together. But, hey, you got to make your pile be an even weight. So you've got to put those two colors together because you don't have any other choices. Right. Um, so here are the results. And um, I'm going to put a picture up here of all six together so you can kind of see the, the gradient or the range. You'll see there's a warm, dark, warm, cool or medium warm and a medium cool, and then a light warm and then a light cool. And in some, a few cases, there is some overlap, like there's some red in the warm medium, and there's also a little bit of that same red in the warm dark. But here they are individually. So here's the warm dark. You've got this really vibrant barber pole here where the brightest and the darkest colors came together. Um, I'm not loving that, but you know, hey, it is what it is. Um, it will blend together in the final finished piece and become something interesting. But here's like some beautiful rusts and greens together, some things that really um, kind of set each other off. And what this color palette is really reminding me of is um, a 1960s, those sort of tapestry type vests um, that you would see that were popular in the 60s and 70s. They almost look brocade or, um, yeah, like a tapestry kind of a look. Um, and that's really what this kind of color palette is reminding me of, these combinations. And I think it's what Andrea's original design with the night shift cowl really reminded, or shawl reminded me of. Um, the way that those colors go together uh, is, is now, again, it's just very mesmerizing and very rich, and it's a lot of different colors all interplaying in really interesting ways. Um, and I've seen other people's versions of the, the night shift shawl online. Um, like I said, it's been a very popular pattern, and people have chosen their own colorways, and it's really amazing. Um, again, that visual texture and the color interplay is very beautiful. Um, really, no matter what palette you pick. So it's kind of magic that way. Here's a uh, warm medium. Um, this is pretty good, except I did get, uh, I ended up with pink on pink right here, this kind of bubblegum color. Again, not my favorite, but working within the constraints of what you're trying to do and achieve with what you have on hand is very interesting. And I'm sure once I knit this up with this pink, it will go with something else as a contrast and it will look cool. Uh, here's probably my favorite colorway just because it has all these blues and teals in it and this is typically what I wear. Obviously you're seeing that on the, <laughs> the shawl, I'll talk about that in a minute. So, but it also has purple and it also has this sort of 
swamp thing color. Uh, sort of an acidy yellow or something like that. And then here's our light color waves. This is like creamsicle, right? Bright orange, fluffy birthday cake, icing pink. But then we also had, I had a little bit of light tan, so that kind of calms it down and brings it back to a more earthy, almost deserty mesa colorway in some places. That's pretty cool. And then this is super bright and tropical. So again, I got Kelly Green on Kelly Green here, so I got a little bit of a solid thing happening, which was not my goal, but that's okay. Um, you might think that's yellow. The one color that I pulled out of all the colorways was this kind of bland butter yellow. I just couldn't stand to look at it. Um, so I, this is chartreuse. This is definitely a, a greeny yellow. And then that's a purple, blue, and you have some darker blue in there for a minute, but overall lighter. So those are my colors. And you know, I don't know, do they go together? <laughs> Going to be really interesting to knit these up, right? These kind of go together because they have a complementary green in them. Do those go together? Who knows? Who cares? I'm going to wear it anyway. Um, but I am not going to knit the night shift shawl. <laughs> um, so, I, like I said, I was mesmerized by this thing. I still am. I still look, stare at it. It's gorgeous. Um, but there's some things about it that I know aren't gonna work for me. Um, and that is no fault of the designer. Um, she's incredibly talented. But on further reflection, so this thing is a, a big triangle. Um, and I have knit my fair share of triangular shawls and I wear none of them. I actually don't even have any more, I gave them all away. Um, because that shape just doesn't stay on me. Um, the, the triangle, basically builds all the weight of the shawl into the point, and so the point drags down, and they just fall off. Um, I don't necessarily want to have to wear a shawl pin. I have one. It's very nice. Um, but, you know, it, it's, it also can be a lot of fabric that gathers. If you wear them, uh, like I'm wearing this one, if you wear it kind of uh, hipster kerchief style, especially a large worsted weight uh, version of a triangular shawl. You end up with a lot of fabric right in the front here. It all kind of gathers and bunches up. It's hard to get a coat on over it. I don't know. It's a lot of problems. So for me, um, I just know that even if I sat down and knit this thing and loved looking at it, it would pr be more likely to become a wall hanging than it would be a, uh, an accessory that I would wear on a regular basis, um, which would be too bad. Um, the other problem I have is that this really is not enough yarn to knit that particular um, item. It, um, it does require about 900 yards and each one of these is just over 100. So I have maybe 675 yards altogether. Um, so whatever I do make is going to be smaller than that item, but that's okay. Um, the, the third thing I will say is that um, Andrea's design is not reversible. And that's another thing I've come to know about myself um, is that if I'm going to wear a scarf or any kind of a wrap or stole, I really do want the fabric to look consistent on both sides. Um, I'm not saying unreversible things are ugly, but um, they do look very inconsistent. And I'm the kind of dresser and person that doesn't always pay complete attention when I'm putting something on. And so inevitably I'll get the wrong side of the fabric showing and it looks messy. It looks unkempt to my eye. So I really like a fabric that is reversible. Um, and I said I was going to talk about this shawl that I have on. This is called uh, the January Skies um, shawl. It's knit with Quinson Company yarn and um, I really loved, I really loved this design when I first saw it come out and immediately asked, I think it was a birthday gift. My mom got me the yarn to make it. Um, and the original has bobbles where you see these overlapping uh, stripes 
each one of these stripes would be a row of baubles. Now, I like baubles. Um, I don't mind knitting them. Some people don't like knitting them, but I think they're a fun texture. But the problem with a bobble is that it looks like a, uh, a great little pop of color on the right side of the fabric, but it sort of looks like um, a messy set of like bad weaving in or something on the wrong side. And I didn't want a wrong side of this fabric. So after playing around with a few different styles of bobbles and trying to come up with a reversible bobble, uh, that did not work. I went ahead and did this slip stitch pattern. It's a slip ste seed stitch and it looks the same on the front and the back, or at least it looks mm, very closely comparable. Um, if you can not the, notice the difference, you have a good design eye, but it, it blends and it has a similar visual texture, very similar on the so-called front and back. So that's what I mean by having something that's reversible. Um, I know this about myself. I know that if I had knit this with the bobbles, I would never wear it. Um, and again, you spent all those hours making something and all that money on the yarn and not wear it. That's a real shame. So I'm all for changing things up, um, changing designs or choosing designs based on the characteristics of the fabric, the characteristics of the shape, um, whatever it is about that item, how it fits you, how it goes with other items in your wardrobe, or how it just goes with your personal style and how you like to wear things. Um, it's better to be choosy or to ch make a change and actually wear the thing than it is to make something perfect and follow a design exactly and never wear it, right? I think we can all agree on that. So, yeah, I'm not gonna knit the night shift because it is even more obviously a right side and wrong sided um, fabric in the end. And um, that's fine, you know, that's your bag, that's great, do it. Um, like I said, I absolutely love the fabric that she came up with and the way that she used the interplay of color. Um, but because of the shape and because of the non-reversibility, I know that that's not gonna work for me. So I'm going to do my own thing. Um, I've Recently, I have been looking at the book Sequence Knitting um, and that's inspired me. I'm actually already working on a, a completely different design um, in another yarn, a commercial yarn, and that will be coming out in May. Um, but I've, I've really enjoyed sequence knitting and many of the sequences are reversible in two colors. Um, so that's interesting. I've also um, gotten a couple of reference books uh, recently when I when I picked up myself one I, I received as a gift for my birthday and there are some techniques in there that have other kinds of reversible um, two color textures that are interesting slip stitches and um, something I can only describe as pseudo bobbles um, that I hadn't seen before but uh, allows you to do those color block things um, that that are reversible. They look the same on both sides. So there's a lot of good um, or, or interesting or motivating ideas that I have for how to combine you know, these, these six that are all very different, um, but how to combine them in an interesting way, use up every last gram of yarn, um, not waste anything, and come up with some kind of an interesting fabric that is going to be reversible and probably some sort of rectangle um, because that's that's what I find that I wear more often. And I'll let you know how it goes. Um, it'll probably take me a few months to to get through that, um, but if all goes well, it could even be become a fully fledged design. Um, and and so we'll see. So um, even though I've, I've been a bit critical of the, the night shift shawl on a personal level, again, I just want to say thank you to Andrea for um, putting that out, for inspiring me, um, for having an amazing sense of color and visual texture. Um, and I really do encourage you all to go check out her design. She has a sweater based on that same um, color combining uh, series. 
and the sweater is really cool looking. Um, so that might be something to knit if you're if you're not a shawl knitter, but you are a sweater knitter. Um, it's cute. It's very cropped um, look. And um, sorry about that. We had a delivery on a Sunday, which was unusual. Um, that took me aback. Um, but what I was saying is that I encourage you to look at uh, Andrea's other designs. Um, she has a lot of really beautiful things and a really wide range of different styles um, from uh, items that combine you know, all kinds of really bright speckle yarns or, or highly variegated yarns to things that are um, much more rustic looking, much more sedate. Um, she does do solid color things as well. Um, and she's got everything from sweaters to accessories, hats. Um, she's quite prolific and very, very talented. So definitely check her out. Um, I also encourage you to go you know, go into your closet and pull out your hand knits and carefully look at those and see which items you gravitate towards and which ones you wear most often. And then the next time you look at that, you know, must have super popular design, think about how that goes with anything else in your wardrobe. Um, whether it's the color, whether it's the shape, the style, um, the knitting technique, you know, think carefully about how many hours you're going to spend making that thing and whether you're truly going to get a lot of use out of it. And if you're not, you know, Ravelry has hundreds of thousands of patterns and you might find something else that will sort of tick that box or scratch that itch, but that has the, the shape or the style or the fit that is really going to suit you better. Um, I think, you know, I've, I've even seen a little bit of mention of this over on Instagram and in some other um, public conversations lately that we can get wrapped up in um, what's the hot new trend in, in knitting or in any other craft. Um, what's the latest beer style? Or what's the latest, you know, whatever it is. And that's all well and good. But if you don't like that thing, or if it doesn't go with the rest of your wardrobe, or um, you know something like that, then it, it can be tempting to spend a lot of time and money doing something that doesn't really have a payoff. I, I guess that's what I'm really getting at here with my rambling. And so I just encourage you to, yeah, bookmark that that hot new thing, um, but. Give yourself a little time to pause. Really think about how that's going to fit within the rest of your daily life and your style and see if it's a great match for you to spend time and money doing or whether you might need to modify that or tweak it or just save a picture on your phone that you can stare at and you know don't make it, but you can visually appreciate it anyway, right? Um, I hope that made sense, and uh, I hope you will um, give yourself time and space to see what really inspires you and to make something uh, beautiful. Thanks for joining me, and tune in next week for more. Thanks a lot.